a moment of silence for Mark D'Antonio. It's over. Next on Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Cook. Waits for it, Nick Cook. This is no time for that. In the pocket and a sack. Tim Jamison. Brady gets terrific. Throws it, and a touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got it. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Kohler at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On its way. It's good. He's 5'7", 179 pounds, a junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure coming. Sack. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. Win it. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. Go Blue, and welcome to this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. I am Steve Dace. We're going to have some fun coming up in the Wolverine Digest roundtable portion of the program with an Ask Me Anything, and we've got questions on football, basketball, and just flat-out trolling. So we'll do that later on with our good friends Michael Spath and Brandon Brown from WTK and Ann Arbor, as well as Wolverine Digest coming up here in a matter of moments. But just as we were beginning to tape this week's episode, breaking news out of East Lansing, Mark D'Antonio is done as the Michigan State football coach. Now, let's say this right from the outset. Hall of Fame resume, no question about it. Best coach Michigan State has had since the Biggie Munn, Duffy Doherty era, and you're going back now about a half a century. He owned us for several years. Got to give him credit for that as well. Uh, Maybe no coach in the modern era in the Big Ten got more out of the proverbial chip on the shoulder than did Mark D'Antonio. So let's, let's acknowledge that from the outset. And now let's move on, though, to the rest of the story. At what price was the victory? At what, to what extent was he willing to go to in order to win? Well, there are some things we know. A senior captain was busted this year for PEDs, and I'm just telling you, having covered numerous sports teams in my career, a guy rarely is doing PEDs, particularly if he's a senior captain. Is he rarely doing those off in the corner all by himself? For example, why did a certain linebacker get suspended from the Rose Bowl just a few years ago? Just asking. All of the sexual assaults that decimated the 2016 class. We now know about all of that as well. And now, apparently, Curtis Blackwell, the former assistant coach that is suing Mark D'Antonio in the university and has them right now by the short hairs with uh, sworn depositions that have unveiled his allegations that Mark D'Antonio also committed NCAA violations. Whether or not that stuff is true, It's hard to believe that if there was nothing to any of it, Mark D'Antonio would be quitting at one of the worst possible times, just 24 hours before National Signing Day, and with it very difficult 
to get a new head coach. He's already deeply involved in winter prep with the team he's coaching now. And then he's probably got to wonder, what's coming down the pike here? What's Michigan State going to get hammered with that I don't know about? Ask Al Golden at Miami how that can screw you as a coach when the penalties you didn't think were coming do, and you never can build momentum in your program. And then there's just the difficult task of replacing a guy that has been a legend, although maybe there's maybe there's another side of the story. Maybe, maybe the, the reputation isn't as pristine as we were sold. You know, that whole Dean of Discipline thing that the Big Ten Network tried selling us on. I believe that was the same season that Mark D'Antonio had a Michigan State player uh, airlifted out of a poke, out of the poke to play a game in Iowa City the very day that he got out of, of jail. Uh, here's what I think happened with Mark D'Antonio. And it's not a unique story. I think what happened with Mark D'Antonio is the same thing that happened to Barry Bonds and the same thing that happened to Roger Clemens and several other players in that era who were using steroids. Guys who would have been great players anyway. Alex Rodriguez was going to be a great player anyway. Guys who would have been Hall of Famers anyway. Oh, well, you know, maybe a Rafael Palmeiro wouldn't have been a Hall of Famer. Certainly, though, Roger Clemens would have been. But that wasn't enough. Contentment is difficult. And then you see guys excelling. Maybe you're slowing down and you get panicked and you're like, you know what? I want to do more. I, I, I want to walk down the street like Ted Williams once said and have people say, hey, there goes so-and-so, the best damn ball player that ever lived. And so you cut corners, you get sloppy, you cheat. I think Mark D'Antonio did build a lot of character into the Michigan State football program. Having been around that program quite a bit growing up in the state of Michigan, there's and, and having a lot of members of my family that were huge Michigan State fans, there's no way you can sustain the level of success he had there for as long as he did by just purely cheating and cutting corners. You cannot do it. They don't have those kinds of advantages at Michigan State. And, and sure, it was advantageous that Michigan was scuffling down the road with the likes of Rich Rodriguez and Brady Hoke was still clapping. But I, I think as Michigan fans that we would be disrespectful and not to mention dishonest if we made it look like the whole thing was a farce and a facade. It wasn't. The guy's a hell of a football coach. But then I think Michigan hired Jim Harbaugh and he realized that the days of Michigan apologizing for losing, like Brady Hoke once did, were over. That Michigan was serious about football now. And I think that's really where the corner cutting kicked into high gear and not with, and I don't think it's any coincidence that Michigan state's football program has begun to go downhill ever since that first season when he beat Michigan on a miracle play, beat Iowa on a miracle goal line stand in the big 10 championship game. And then afterwards, Mark D'Antonio infamously told the Fox sports broadcast team that I think quote, we have God's favor unquote. Since playing that card, Mark D'Antonio and Michigan State have fallen on hard times. A lot of blowout losses, including 44-10 to in his final game against Michigan. A lot of off-the-field problems. Now maybe NCAA violations. An ignominious end to the Mark D'Antonio era, which brings to mind another biblical reference. Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. You always reap what you sow. If you like what we do here at Michigan Podcast and you want to support us in any way, please consider joining our Patreon page. Patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast. All one word. You can use any dollar amount whatsoever. But if you are into sports handicapping, you want to get a hold of the picks that I put up there exclusively uh, almost every day now that we're into college basketball season and they're doing fairly well this season, you can get access to those for just $5 a month at patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast. I want to thank all of you, hundreds of you that are supporting us right now on our Patreon page. We appreciate your kindness. It definitely helps us to continue putting in the effort to put out Michigan podcast every week. For the rest of you, please consider supporting us as well at patreon.com slash Michigan podcast. Back here on Michigan Podcast, and it's time for the Wolverine Digest Roundtable. Joining me, my partners over at 
Wolverine Digest, Brandon Brown, Michael Spath. Gentlemen, good to have you with us. How are you? Doing good. I'm stunned at the moment, but otherwise, okay. Indeed. Before we get to the questions, and we've got a few doozies lined up for everybody to answer, I, I would be remiss if I did not ask each of you about the news today. What was it, about 12 minutes after the Curtis Blackwell deposition, the uh, embattled former assistant coach who was suing Mark D'Antonio, his uh, former boss at Michigan State, uh, for his uh, wrongful termination, and he alleged in a sworn deposition that D'Antonio had committed NCAA violations. And literally about 12 minutes later, Mark D'Antonio decides to resign as head coach of Michigan State just two days before signing day in the dead of February. Your thoughts, gentlemen, on uh, on this news and um, and the, and saying goodbye, bidding adieu uh, to the man that the Big Ten Network once dubbed the Dean of Big Ten Discipline. Brandon, I'll start with you. Yeah, couldn't happen to a better guy. Uh, I, don't, I mean, he's there, there's clearly something going on behind the scenes here. I mean, I don't think there's any question. As a person who used to cover recruiting extensively, um, yeah, there was some shady stuff going on. There's some stories that I heard that, if true, are ex- absolutely despicable. You have to think that Mark D'Antonio knew about some of that stuff. Um, the fact that Curtis Blackwell was comfortable with saying these things under oath, you know, in a legal setting, um, I, I mean, I, I don't know why he would lie about that kind of thing or why he would feel like that would be a good idea. And then, again, like you mentioned, the fact that it, his resignation comes out like literally minutes after, you know, the Blackwell stuff hits the, hits the market, it, it just doesn't look good. It looks bad. I mean, he, he took Michigan State football to a, a level that most probably thought was impossible, but it's crumbled in a hurry. And uh, this this is kind of like the last big boulder because this is, uh, you know, pretty surprising that it happened now ahead of, just a, just a couple months after the early signing day, the day before national signing day, a couple weeks after he got his big bonus, it just it looks pretty bad all the way around. It looks bad. Brandon, I want to go back to you for a follow up before I, I I bring Michael into the conversation. When you look at um, the 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 PED uses uh, there with uh, the, the uh, Joe Bashi, the linebacker this year. Uh, whatever happened that caused uh, the linebacker to get suspended uh, a couple of years ago in the Rose Bowl, when you look at uh, everything that went off off the field as chronicled by outside the lines, I think, was it Glenn Stanton? Was he the player that they, they airlifted from the uh, poke to Iowa City for a football game same day? They ended up getting their asses kicked that day, from what I recall. But how much of this, th- there's no denying his record, and I think we all need to admit we're all Michigan fans, right? And so there's some there, there's got to be some rivalry myopia that the audience should factor that you know handicap into their uh, you know their response to our analysis. But since you went there on things you heard when you used to cover recruiting full time, and I've alluded to some other things that we now know about as well, how much of what Mark D'Antonio did at Michigan State, which was tremendous when you just look at the resume, but how much of it was real, Brandon? Uh, I mean, you, you know, you, you win the games. I mean, you know, that we've talked about this about different programs and whether Michigan is participating in it on any level or not. Like you, these coaches are getting paid tens of millions of dollars to win as many football games as they can in most cases by any means possible. And so, I mean, if that's the landscape of college football, then Mark D'Antonio was doing what a lot of other guys were doing. Now that doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it okay. But he was able to he was able to take a lot of recruits and a lot of players that other schools didn't want, and by one means or another turn them into players that got results on the field. And I, I still think he's going to have a pretty well. I guess I can't say that we just don't know enough yet about what's going on or why he resigned or what actually is going to come out. But I mean, the dude won. He made it to a playoff. He won multiple Big Ten titles. I mean, those those are the facts. It is what it is. So I, I think you know if it's a little bit tainted cool nobody cares nobody seems to care about that stuff anymore so what's going to stand and what's going to stand and what's going to last um you know from his you know 10 10 year or 10 plus year run is is those you know those trophies in the record and and they're pretty damn good michael same question to you i mean this is in terms of just pure resume he's the best coach michigan state's had in about a half a century since biggie munn and and duffy doherty how much of it though was real uh, based off of what it seems was going on off the field there, or to procure certain players. Well, I'm not gonna honestly. I, I think the interesting thing about this Curtis Blackwell situation and the fact that he is, uh, 
testifying under oath and Antonio's had to testify under oath is that the truth shall shall come out, right? And so, you know, one of the rumors is that there's a number of players on Michigan State that were using performance enhancing drugs. And I, I think if the if we can't really you know, what do you do with that? You you can't really completely discredit what the guy accomplished. Now if it comes out that Curtis Blackwell names 20 guys that were on Big Ten championship teams and a couple of them were really key players and said, hey, look, I've got proof that these guys were using uh, steroids or the, or the like, then, yeah, I think we all look back at it and go, okay, did he really turn two-star, you know, diamonds in the rough into, uh, into standouts or did he cheat his way to get there? Um, so I think that's all going to come out in the next couple of weeks as this uh, Curtis Blackwell situation continues to move forward. <laughs> you know, I think Mark D'Antonio was a very good coach that at least when you look at like the chip on the shoulder type motivation, when you look at the aggressive uh, mentality that he instilled in his defense, those are things that whether those guys were, were cheating or not, he did bring that type of added. Shock the, the, let's face it, the little brother type of mentality that had always been there. So I think there's some things that he did on the football field, resumes-wise, that were impressive, that will never go away. But looking at what he's doing here today, uh, walking away from it after he's about to get in trouble, yeah, I mean, it's a bad look. I agree with Brandon, but I'll say this, too. Don't you think there's a little bit of the Michigan State Athletic Department saying they knew about this a couple weeks ago because this deposition's been going on for a while, and here, we'll – Go ahead and take your $4.3 million signing bonus or your bonus that you get by staying on until January 20th. And when push comes to shove at the end here, we need you to fall on the grenade. Mm -hmm. We need you to... That's your buyout, uh, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And look, here's the thing. is If if Curtis Blackwell accuses Sue Stantonio and accuses Stantonio of violating NCAA rules and and it comes out in a public uh, forum and Michigan State can say, look... This is a Mark D'Antonio thing, not a Michigan State thing. There's really no reason to punish us with sanctions and the whole like. And it screws them right now in terms of trying to find a new coach, or it screws another program if they go get Luke Fickle. Uh, so it screws Cincinnati. But it's going to set them back for a year or for two years, but it'll set them back for a lot longer if Michigan State gets punished for any of the violations. Instead, if it's D'Antonio who just looks and goes, well, I'm the one that – this was on me, and I had full autonomy, and this was not a, you know, um, what's, the, what's the term that they use when institutional, lack of institutional control? Mm-hmm. I think he could be doing that right now, and he might, I mean, I don't want to give this guy any credit because I don't think he deserves any, but I think he might be, as I said, falling on a grenade for Michigan State, and Michigan State gave him that bonus to make sure he did. The part about this that I am just bewildered by is – you know, you you're a new parent, as as is Brandon. Congratulations again to both of you. You're going to have moments with your children where you saw this coming a mile away, told them how it was going to end, and be mystified that they went through with it anyway, like our parents were with us, right? So when you when you drive up to a down power line and you get out of the car, the minute you get out of the car, why did you think this was going to end well? When they when right, when, they, when right. they didn't pay off Curtis Blackwell, just pay him off. When they said, "Sure, yeah, we'll see you in court," how did they think it was possible? The minute that judge ordered that Blackwell could depose them under oath, they should have found out found whatever money they weren't paying Nasser's victims to just pay him to go away. Why did they think this was ever going to end well? Well, Steve. I'll just jump in here. I mean, you you dropped the name in there, Nasser. This might be the worst athletic administration in the country since at least since the Jerry Sandusky scandal, which was a decade ago now or close to a decade ago now. I mean, this is this is a a group. Whether you're talking about the president, the interim president, the athletic director, the interim athletic director, the new athletic director. I mean, this is a bungling, bumbling, fumbling, dumb, stupid, uh, arrogant, uh, whatever term you want to use. This is the worst administration quite possibly in college athletics right now. So you ask, like, how do you walk up to a power line and think it's going to end well? Well, these people have the IQ and the PR ability of 
you know, a, a fly. Like they're just they're they're just not capable of making good decisions. So that's how they walked up to a power line. They they walked up to a power line. They probably said like, "Hey, let's um sprinkle some water on our hands, and then <laughs> touch this thing and try to reconnect it ourselves to the to the power grid here." I mean, these people are morons. They're absolute morons. They're incompetent. That's how it happened. This was an absolute hold my beer move. No doubt about it. I mean, yeah. at this, I mean, I, yeah. they, when, when the, Mark D'Antonio's first line at this deposition should have been. Hey, Ma, look, I mean, this was always going to end poorly. It was just a matter of when. All right, let's get let's get to the questions that the audience has prepared for us to talk about Michigan in the maize and blue. You guys ready to go? Sure. All right, let's see what we have. This begins with Nathan Sullivan, who wants to know who is your breakout defensive player for football in 2020? Brandon, I'll go to you first. Ooh, breakout defensive player. Well, as I said, the, as I said, the term in my head, the first name that popped in was a was a big one that a lot of Michigan fans are going to be watching, and it's Daxton Hill. I don't know how you can think that a kid that talented who was able to crack into, I, I mean, crack into a starting lineup, uh, you know, albeit in kind of a specialized role, and then because of injury, a little bit towards the end. But a kid that talented, a kid that touted, arguably the fastest player on the field, isn't going to, you know, step into a major starting role and and have an impact. I mean, he. Even in the limited action that he had, he was able to make a few plays, recovered a fumble, uh, you know, had a couple, te- have a, had a couple, had at least one play on a special teams uh, fake punt. You could see the speed on covering kickoffs, and then again, I think he, you know, he, he was able to make an interception later on in the year, and he just kind of has a knack for being around the ball. And I remember covering him as a recruit. You know, I heard that he's just kind of this generational talent. This ball hawk has a nose for the ball, just always manages to make a big play. And uh, as a true sophomore, I expect him to have a lot more of those because he's going to be on the field a lot. I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, I I don't think he came off the field on defense the last game or two of the season when he was in there in a starting role. So clearly the coaches grew to trust him a lot. And, uh, you know, second year in the program, that's only going to go up, and he's going to be called on to be one of the main guys back there. So I think he's just going to have an opportunity to play a lot more football. And because of his natural athletic ability, he's gonna he's gonna make some splash plays. Michael, you agree, or you have another name in mind? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I agree that Daxon Hill is going to be uh, a, a very important player for Michigan next year, and I, I like it. I was honestly looking at thinking about Ambry Thomas, but I thought that was a little cheap for two reasons: one, he was a full time starter this past year, and and two, you know, I, I, I think when you look at college spread offenses today, it isolates a great number one cornerback a little bit. So I'm going to go with uh, someone along the defensive line uh, who, honestly, if Michigan's going to beat Wisconsin next year and uh, have any chance to beat Ohio State and, and pull off a couple of big wins, they got to get something out of Chris Hinton at defensive tackle. I mean, mm-hmm. he's over 300 pounds, former five-star, has all the physical skills. Carlo Kemp, I wonder what Carlo Kemp looks like as a defensive tackle if he's next to a 315 pounder that eats up multiple blockers and is still making plays because I think Kemper Dwumpor on their own next to somebody like that could have been really successful for Michigan. I think when you pair two undersized defensive tackles next to each other, then you're just, you know, you're going to get taken out of too many plays. So I'm looking at Chris Hinton. Uh, I think if he is the breakout player next year, he, you know, him in the front end, Dex Hill in the back end, that Michigan's got a chance to be better than they were in uh, 2019. I want to say like they're going to you know win a national championship or anything like that, but they would be better than they would in 2019. Those are both good picks. I'll go a little contrarian because that's how I roll, and you guys already picked two uh, really good ones. I'm going to go with Michael Barrett. And I've, I've been intrigued with him uh, since he came in in that 2018 class. Uh, just his prep profile, his athleticism, and he, he strikes me as the kind of guy that when Paul Johnson really had it going at Georgia Tech, would have gone there and had a great career as their triple option quarterback. And I think him filling in for Kalik Hudson at the Viper position, and he's kind of bounced around a few positions, seems to have settled down there. And, and that's one of the few holes that Michigan has uh, to plug. Uh, on defense uh, for 2020. So I'm going to go with Michael Barrett out of Georgia as uh, potentially Michigan's new Viper as my breakout player on defense in 2020. Our next question here, it comes from Andrew Burris, who wants to know, is it true Michigan is only an elite quarterback away from getting to the next level? Michael, 
You go first. Is it true? We don't really know because we haven't seen an elite quarterback play at Michigan and see how much it elevates the play of everybody around them. If it makes this offense go from, uh, you know, the number 50 unit in the country to the number unit in the country. And if it does, is there, you know, do the defensive lapses against Ohio State and Wisconsin last year and Penn State in the past, are those too big to overcome? I would certainly like to see what, what, what transpires. I mean, I think if they have one of the best quarterbacks in college football, one of the top ten quarterbacks, one of the top five, I'd say next year their their basement is 11 wins. Um, they haven't had that, and they and so they've been winning nine and ten games at, at max the last few years. So I don't know that it, it is. That's all that's missing um, because again, like you know, do they play against Ohio State? Do they lose the game 63 to 56? I'm not really sure. But it would go a long way towards taking this team and taking this program up another level. Goodness, if we had a 63-56 Michigan-Ohio State game, <laughs> Bo and Woody would both come down here and kick our asses for that. Good grief. Brandon, what are your thoughts? Is Michigan truly just an elite quarterback away from the next level? I don't think it's quite that simple. I mean, I agree with what Mike said. I mean, shoot, you, I, just as Mike was kind of talking through the hypotheticals, I was thinking, like, okay, what's Michigan look like with Trevor Lawrence, that quarterback, or Justin I Fields, was doing the same exact thing. Yes, that's what I was doing. Yep. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously that would be a huge uptick from what we got out of Shea Patterson last year. But is that, a, again, to Mike's point, is that enough to close the gap between Michigan and Ohio State? I'm not sure that it is. I mean, when you look across the rest of the board, Ohio State's going to have – uh, two guys drafted in the top five of the NFL draft in a couple of months here. Michigan might not put a guy in the first round. So, like, there are still gaps up in other places, and, and I think that's that's to be mentioned and to be paid attention to. But you can put a lot of Band-Aids on some things with a quarterback like the two I just mentioned. So I think, yeah, I think Mike is right. I mean, is it 11, is it 11 wins next year with a quarterback like that? Is one of the quarterbacks on the roster potentially that good? I would probably say no, or they would have already been playing because we, we see how special Justin Fields was in year one at Ohio State and how special Trevor Lawrence was last year as a true freshman. So I think it would, it would certainly take everything up to another level and get them in that discussion, but I still think there's like a couple things here and there that need to be a little bit better. I don't think it is the only thing, but I think it is the primary thing. And I think the, I like the yeah. way that Brandon approached it because I was doing the same mental math. If you just the last couple of years, uh, you, uh, Kyler Murray, um, Jalen Hurts, uh, Tua Tagovailoa, uh, Trevor Lawrence, d- just name some of those names. Uh, Joey Burrow, put those mm-hmm. on uh, trade quarterbacks last year. Put Dwayne Haskins on Michigan and Shea Patterson on Ohio State. Uh, trade quarterbacks this year. Put Shea Patterson on Ohio State. Put Justin Fields on Michigan. All right. At, at the very least, is that a competitive game going into the fourth quarter? I think at the very least, that's the case. So I, I don't think it's 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 everything, but it is the primary thing, no doubt. And, and I think at the very least, it's the cost of admission to get into that space. Now, whether you can still close the sale remains to be seen. You know, Ohio State, I don't think, had its most athletic or at least effective linebacker unit ever. Uh, And that's usually a really strong unit for them. And you saw Trevor Lawrence run all over them in the playoff, for example. But it's, it's the price of poker. You can't get to the table without that player. Now, whether that's enough to to win those two games is another question, but I don't think you would get to the, you get to the final table at the main event without that kind of a quarterback. Um, Let's get to the next question. This comes from Robert Hill. Why is Harbaugh so untouchable? And how come everyone blames everyone else, like assistants, the quarterback, et cetera, other than him, for the failure to meet expectations? Brandon, you get to take this one first. Go ahead. Well, I think you're asking the wrong two guys this question because apparently (laughs) Mike and I hate Jim Harbaugh and we hate Michigan football and we want him to lose every game. (laughs) Um, Yeah, no, I I mean, I, I I don't think that he is. I mean, me personally, I've been critical of him. Josh Gaddis, the offensive coordinator at Michigan, blocked me on Twitter because he thought I was too critical of him at some point, I guess, which I don't really understand or know why or when that even happened because he and I used to have a pretty good relationship when I was covering recruiting. So I, I know I skipped off of Jim Harbaugh a little bit, but we've been critical. I, I, we haven't treated Jim Harbaugh untouchable at all, and I think he has failed to meet expectations, and I would say that to him. I mean, if, if that was allowed or if that was what we were doing. 
you know, in a round table setting or something like that. And certain people at the me- in the media have asked Jim Harbaugh. I mean, I, it was Jordan Strack. I think he's out of Toledo or in Ohio somewhere. Uh, I don't really know him very well. We follow each other on Twitter, responded back and forth to each other a couple of times. That's it. But I, I loved his question after the Ohio State game. He said, you know, last year's game, this year's game, the point differential, the yardage, all that, like what needs to happen to close that gap? And Jim Harbaugh got all offended. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll answer your questions, but not your insults. Like, no, Jim, that's not an insult. That's exactly what happened on the field. So how about you try answering it? And he wouldn't do it. And then his wife is yelling out stuff from the back of the presser. So I, I don't really know. If, first of all, I don't really know if it's accurate that he is untouchable. I think some people are perfectly fine with questioning what he's doing. And then on the flip side of that, I, don't, I, don't, I think it's warranted. I mean, I think it's warranted to criticize what he's doing. And I think, I think there are some people who are doing that, and Michael and myself included. And you, and you, Steve. Sorry to leave you out of that. No, no, I appreciate it because I don't have enough people to dislike me. Michael, what about you? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you two things from talking to a couple of sources from the athletic department over the weekend. And number one, the bottom line. The bottom line is Michigan is a incredibly successful uh, athletic department financially. And what do they attribute that to? They attribute that to largely to football and to Jim Harbaugh. Um, and so because donors are, are pitching over, forking over a lot of money, uh, and because the stadium is sold out, and because they're a draw uh, on TV and they sell merchandise, Jim Harbaugh getting paid seven and a half, eight million million. I think he's about to get his bonus. He's going to go up to $8 million. Uh, he's worth every penny. If you, you talk to some people in the like department. And the second thing I'll tell you, the reason that um, a lot of people are still on, you know, on the bandwagon and is – as a, one of the athletic department officials said to me, how many programs have fired a coach who's won 75% of his games? And I was kind of talking to him, and I said, well, I said, the ones I can think of are, you know, essentially LSU departing ways with Les Miles a year ago, and Nebraska getting rid of uh, Bo Pelini and Frank Solich before that. He said, yeah, and how did, those, how did that work out for Nebraska? And I said, well, for Nebraska, it hasn't worked out very well. For LSU, it's worked out brilliantly. And mm-hmm. he's like, yeah, I just, he's like, we would be, he's like, we would be the laughing stock of college football and the laughing stock of football if we fire Jim Harbaugh when he's winning north of 70% of his games and close to 75% of his games. I said, yeah, but he, you know, he hasn't won the Big Ten title. And he said, okay, so we got a great bottom line and he's winning 75% of his games. So how do we fire that guy? I think it's as simple as that. I think that is why. Uh, Jim, if they sign him, as I've heard, to a contract extension coming up, if he if he's here for another 10 years, I think it boils down to those two things. As long as they're making money and as long as he's winning at a high enough clip, then they're never, no. at least in the athletic department, at least his boss is never going to force him out, even if they don't ever beat Ohio State or win a Big Ten title. I, I think people want to believe things like that. And I, I've just, I, I've, what I do and the things I've covered in, in my line of work is ultimately human nature doesn't stay the same. It, it's either advancing or it's regressing. And and if, if contentment were easy for people, we wouldn't have midlife crises or mistresses. Contentment is, um, is, is, is difficult to obtain. And that's why you're usually ascending or descending. You're almost never stabilizing. That's just not how human nature basically works. So that everything he told you, Michael, I'm sure that person really believes it. Although, frankly, Michigan's a laughing stock in college football right now because they're 0 and 5 against Ohio State and progressively getting worse. And it's become it's gotten to the point that if you're a Michigan fan, and I say all this as, I mean, Jim Harbaugh is my favorite player growing up. OK, so I'm, I want him to be successful here. But but it, it's it's gotten to the point that you if you're a Michigan fan, you can't consume like any national college football podcast or show or Sirius Sirius XM program in the offseason, or at least you can't when they're talking about your team, um, because it, it's just it, it, it it's difficult to listen to. And you're just mercilessly mocked and and for a couple of year of these years you you pushed back against the phony narratives and now you're at the point what is the point we're just getting our asses kicked by Ohio State so i think they all really mean that but if they have another ohio state game 3 in a row and i hope that they don't if they have 3 in a row like this i i can just i promise you whatever they're saying now 
Human nature doesn't just sit there and just keep taking punches in the face. It's fight or flight. That's how we're, we're that's what we're like as a species. We're not bred just to sit there and just keep getting glocked. So I, I think that sound, it's, it's Mike Tyson. Everyone's got a great plan until they get punched in the mouth. If they take three punches in the mouth like that in a row, things begin to happen. You know, gravity inertia happens. Momentum happens. Like two weeks ago, Mark D'Antonio was a sly dog getting uh, sticking around at Michigan State, not going anywhere and collecting his longevity bonus. And then they took a Curtis Blackwell deposition and some of it got leaked to the media. And now he's not the coach there anymore. And I think three losses in a row like that to Ohio State would render that form of a cataclysm. I do. That's why I think, and that's why I predict it. I think this is a determinative year. I think they will do something um, that, will, that will be considered um, significant, that moves the program forward, or people are going to view it as moving, as the program is moving back. Let's get to the next question. Nathan hey, Bauer. Real quick, yeah, go I ahead, could, Brandon. Go can ahead. I inter, can I interject something real sure. quick that I just read, just because we've talked about it, obviously. Mark D'Antonio will have a press conference tonight at 6.30 before the basketball game. Just throwing that in there. Wow. I, I just... <laughs> yeah. Why? Exactly. why? Listen to Steve Miller, the great prophet. Take the money and run, bro. Take the money <laughs> and run. I cannot... I mean, I just... Wow. Wow. Okay. Wow. M Michael was right. Uh, Forrest Gump said life is like a box of chocolates over there in East Lansing. It's like a box of rocks. I cannot believe he wants to talk to the media after that. Wow. Yep. No. Because it's an obvious no. question. He's going to say, I didn't commit any NSA violations. None of that's true. Well, then why are you quitting 24 hours before signing day, Nimrod? Why are you quitting then? Why would you do that? That doesn't make any sense. No one does a coaching. They're saying we have a full coaching search. Well, Michigan was going to have a full coaching search in September when it fired Steve Fisher, too. And, and no one can do that in September. And no one can do that in February either. I, I just, I, wow. Wow. Okay. Next question. Wow. Nathan Bauer, do you think Franz Wagner and Isaiah Livers go pro after this season? Michael. No and no. And that's as easy as it is. I mean, Isaiah Livers spending half the year injured, and he hasn't showcased enough to NBA scouts that, hey, here's a guy that can put the ball on the floor and create a shot for himself. Um, you know, most of the shots that he does create for himself, he already gets the ball in the low post, and he makes a little bit of a move. I, no, I don't, I don't think that's under consideration at all. And then Franz Wagner, you know, I'll never, never say never because – I've been surprised by people in the past. I was surprised by DJ Wilson going pro. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to name one, you know, Mitch McGarry wasn't a surprise that he went pro. It's just the circumstances in which it happened. Um, so it it, hap it it occurs. But Franz Wagner is so light, and I think he needs to put on some strength, and he needs to showcase more to NBA scouts. I mean, I think if he came out right now, he would be at best – a mid second and potentially just go undrafted. I think both these guys, uh, that's their that's their ceiling right now. Mid second to being undrafted. You come back for another year, you showcase yourself to the NBA, and yeah, I think. But my goodness, I hadn't even considered that. I don't know if there's any way possible either one of these guys is ready to go after this year. Brandon, I'll go to you next. Yeah, I agree with Mike. I mean, I hadn't really. I hadn't really thought about it as being really an option for them. And I mean, Isaiah Livers being hurt certainly put a dent, put a dent in, in if, if he was even thinking about, it. I don't know if I've ever even, I've ever even heard it being a thought from him or something that he's been really thinking about, you know, those kind of things tend to pick up legs a little bit over the course of the season. You wonder how they get out or, you know, I heard this or I heard that. It's not like Isaiah Livers is going to say in a press conference, like, yeah, hey, I'm thinking about going pro. I'm just trying to figure it out as we go. But you start to hear those things throughout the course of the year, and we haven't heard that at all about either of those guys. I know Wagner, you know, at 6'9", and with the skill set that he has, and, you know, the he's coming on a little bit as of late, but I, it just doesn't seem like he's even close to ready, and Mike mentioned, you know, the physical side of things. He's still so skinny. I mean, he's tall, and he's got great length, and he's very, very skilled, but he, he's, he's not quite ready for that yet, I don't think, but... I, to Mike's point also, you see some you see some pretty skinny kids that aren't ready for the NBA uh, skip a year or two and, and, and make the jump 
every year you see it. I mean, mm-hmm. you haven't seen it much at Michigan, but you see it every year. So I, I'd say no. But if it did happen at, at this point with the way that kids are leaving early to go to the pros, I, I never say like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that. I just don't say that anymore because you never know what the situation is or what they're hearing or you know what they're being told by draft people or whatever. I agree on livers. I think the groin injury has really set him back. Um, but I, I could definitely see Franz if, if he has a Mitch McGarry like NCAA tournament. And I think it's possible with his skill set, his ability, he's a matchup nightmare. And one of the things, the most promising thing I think about Franz Wagner is all of his mistakes are out of aggression. Meaning at some point that motor function is going to align. At some point, what he thinks he can do is going to align with what uh, physically with that potential. And when that happens, look out. And I and we saw that for Mitch McGarry. I mean, if somebody would have asked you, you know, on February, the first week of February 2013, when you Mitch McGarry going pro, you're like, well, let's see him play 10 minutes in a game first. And then by the time we got to March Madness of that year, he was the second best player in the NCAA tournament, not named Trey Burke. So I, I could see with his skill set, I could see a Franz Wagner blowing up like that because it's also an anemic NBA draft. One of the things you're seeing in college basketball this year is the one and done crop is pretty weak. There's a couple of guys that would be a one and done in any year, a James Weissen, Weissman, a Cole Anthony, but one of them's ineligible and the other guy has had a bad knee most of the season. And a lot of these other guys that are one and dones this year, like your Vernon Carey types, are nowhere near the Zion Williamson, R.J. Barrett one and dones we typically see. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot more um, uh, you know, parody in college basketball this year. So with an anemic draft, if, 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 if you know, Franz Wagner goes off in the NCAA tournament and takes Michigan to a deep into the second weekend or a third weekend, I could see it. But I think it would have to take a circumstance like that for it to even be a consideration. All right, next up here with our Ask Me Anything from Zane Gates. Does any other football program in America have players posting pictures on Instagram after an embarrassing loss to your rival with the caption, people hate me because they don't have my gifts? Brandon, you get that one first. Um, I didn't even know that that what fill me in here. This is news to me. I didn't even see this or know what you're referencing. I I didn't either because I'm not on Instagram and and it, it's you know the my company would like me to do it, but since my kids keep pushing me to join it, I'm just not doing it out of spite now. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm not familiar with that, but my understanding is he is referring to what um, a certain Michigan player who's no longer here. Was uh, was posting on his Instagram after the Ohio State game. Um, I would gu- I would guess so. I mean, I don't know. I, I I know a lot of times these days, you know, the the recruits and the players in college are using Instagram and Twitter as kind of their own breaking news type of thing and their own brand advancement and you know trying to get out there and be visible and be. I, I I don't put a ton of stock into it. I mean, that's obviously not a good look, and I I don't. I, I didn't know that that happened and I wouldn't, if I was a coach, I wouldn't really want my players doing that. But I, I don't know. I just don't, I don't think I care. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm somewhat involved with social media more than I probably should be as a 35 year old dude, but it's kind of what comes with the territory <laughs> of covering recruiting and being in the, in the media and you have to, you have to keep up on it. I mean, I mean, hell, Mark Antonio just retired via Twitter. So you, you can you have to, you have to pay attention to these things, but I, I would assume yes. I mean, I'm, I'm not combing the Instagram files of every star player for other teams, when, in, you know, after big losses. But right. we see it in the NFL. I mean, you know, Dinks in the NFL are running Instagram live when their coach is giving a post game speech. I'm like, what the hell is that about? But it, it happens. Like, it happens at all levels for various different reasons and situations that are good and bad. So I don't think that's a problem specific to Michigan, and I don't really think it's even really that big of a problem, to be honest. So, Michael, Brandon mentioned some in the NFL, some cases like this in the pros. I mean, it, it, like after Auburn beat Alabama, and and you know Alabama fans are losing their damn minds because it knocked him out of the playoff. I mean, were there kids on Instagram making these kinds of proclamations or when Georgia lost to LSU in the SEC championship game, effectively ending their season? I, I don't know. I'm asking. I, I, because we, we do seem to get some of these things at Michigan – um, I, that, but I don't know if it's unique, uh, or if this happens comprehensively. I think it happens everywhere. And, and honestly, the, 
only value I see of social media when it comes to athletes tweeting is if they're sharing news that we can report in terms of trash talk or um, coming out and yeah, mostly just trash. I, I really don't care at all. Yeah. I mean, we remember what it was like to be 18 to 23. Well, maybe we don't remember what it was like, but uh, yeah, it's just, you know, put our make our lives a little more public at that age. And what stupid things were we doing? I, so I don't I don't care in the least. I mean, if if a guy announces his transfer, if a guy announces he's quitting a program, if a guy announces uh, anything that's newsworthy, I'll pay attention to on social media. But other than that, I don't care. And frankly, I don't cover. I, I don't follow hardly any any um, either college or pro athletes. I just don't do it. It's just not interesting to me. I don't need to know your opinion. I don't need to hear you say anything about the opposing team or, or about your coach or anything like that. I, I really, um, some people do, and that's their prerogative, but I mean, I can count on one hand how many current Michigan student athletes across three major sports, hockey, basketball, and football, I follow on t- Twitter. You should have ended that with a get off my lawn. It was beautiful. <laughs> You've been at this fatherhood thing for like for like five or six weeks, dude. You're nailing it. That's perfect. All right. Thanks. I uh, appreciate it. I right. appreciate it. We've got three more rapid fire. So we're gonna we got three of us. We're each gonna tackle one of these. Okay. So Michael, back to you for this one from Gary Klein, who says, I'm a Michigan fan in Ohio, and I feel like we've become the Browns. It's always wait until next year. When will next year arrive for Jim Harbaugh? What do you think, Michael? When is it next year? Wow. 2022? Schedule is so watered down. Oh, I love um, that 2022 schedule. Inject that right into my veins. That's sponsored by the SEC, baby. I love it. Yeah. I think one of us could lead Michigan to 10 wins that year um, with no head coaching experience. How crappy that schedule is. Um, So, yeah, maybe 2022. Maybe 2022. I don't think it's going to happen this year. I don't think even... Even if they start the year 11-0, I don't see them beating Ohio State with Justin Fields there on the road. In 2021, Michigan's at home against Ohio State, but not like that's helped Michigan at all uh, in three previous tries here. So, yeah, I think next year for Michigan, if Jim Harbaugh's around, is 2022. All right, Brandon, this one is for you as we go rapid fire here to close out the Ask Me Anything. Marcus Grandin wants to know, how does Michigan basketball get to 20 wins? And do you think they need that, and I think he means in the regular season, to make the NCAA tournament? Oh, boy. What do they have, 14 right now? Yes, 13. 13. 13, 13 and 8. Oh, 13. Okay. Yeah, with 10 well, games to go. Yeah, we, we talked about this on the radio. Was your today. answer going to be they've got to go 7-3? and three, That's my answer to get to 20 wins. Was that going to be your answer? That was perfect. I'd have loved it if that was your answer. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, just a simple math of uh, 7 plus 3. No, uh, 7 plus 13. No, we, we talked about this on the radio today uh, inside the huddle and over Michigan's next 10 games. I feel like the most likely the most likely outcome is 5-5. Five and five. I mean, there's there's some – some moderate, you know, moderately tough games on the road. Uh, Michigan does have some winnable games at home, and and I think that's enough. I think that's enough to get into the tournament. I don't know if twenty wins is the is the bar that they need to get to. I think if they win five, if they win five of the next ten, you know, go five and five, win a game or two in the NCAA tournament. Or I'm sorry, the Big Ten tournament. Then they'll make the NCAA tournament, and it'll be you know, it'll be a modest seed, seven, eight, nine seed, somewhere in that range, but. That's all you need. You just need a seat at the table. So, no, I don't think they will get to 20 wins, but I still think they'll make the tournament. Yeah, if they go 5-5 five and five down the stretch, which I think is very doable, I mean, they're going to be top 10 in the country probably in quad one wins as it stands right now. Yeah, they've, yeah. they've got – yeah, the, the, the record's not going to look amazing. They probably won't be a top 25 team, but they're, they're going to have some really quality wins on the resume. I agree. Well, we have to throw in one troll, so I will tackle the final one, which is a trolling question from Buckeye30 who wants to know how many more wins does it take for you guys to admit this rivalry thing is over? I have already admitted it. As far as I am concerned, Michigan has an 11 game schedule until further notice. I've already told all of you guys that watch this show when this game is played next year, I'm going to be at Godzilla versus Kong with my son the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Mm. I am not subjecting myself to this again. What it does to me is it makes me hate 
my own team. I hate it. It makes me despise the coach that was my favorite player growing up. I can't stand it. And so I am simply going to eject. I'll DVR the game. If I come home and they and they shocked the world, I will en- still enjoy it as if it was live because I also won't have, have to worry about going through any of the heart palpitations in the interim. But I can't take it anymore. I have been defeated. I have beaten down. I don't, I, I've been Apollo Creed, man. I have, except this time I was smart enough to throw the damn towel. All right. So I have thrown in the towel. I am like George Costanza in the Master of My Own Domain episode of Seinfeld. Actually, I think it was Kramer. I've just bolted through the door. I'm out. I'm out. So you win. I, I, I don't, you're arguing with the wrong host. I can't speak for Brandon and Michael, but I am officially out. Gentlemen, it's uh, always good to have you with us here on Michigan Podcast. Thanks for being with us and uh, go blue. We'll do this again next week. It was fun. Thank you. All right, Thank you. Don't forget, you can stay up to date with everything we talk about here on Michigan Podcast in between episodes by visiting our website at WolverineDigest.com. Again, that's WolverineDigest.com. Myself, Michael Spath, and Brandon Brown keep you up to date each and every day on everything trending and happening with the maize and blue. So again, if you want to stay up to date on those Michigan Wolverines, go to WolverineDigest.com. Again, that's Wolverine digest.com this week's twitter poll we asked you who do you think will be michigan starting quarterback for the 2020 season opener at washington about a 60 40 split 60 percent of you believe it'll be dylan mccaffrey 40 percent of you agree with me that joe milton will be michigan starting quarterback on september the 5th that brings us to our question of the week which we don't have. You know why? Because we gave you an Ask Me Anything. So we did like nine questions this week. Why have just one question of the week when you're going to have nine of them this week? And that'll do it uh, for all of us here at Michigan Podcast. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. Rate as the case may be, whether it's YouTube or uh, the various podcast platforms that you can listen to this show on, the more of those we get, the more it helps us to find more Michigan fans just like you. And don't forget to check us out at Wolverine Digest and Michigan Podcast each and every day in between episodes as well, as we keep you up to date on what's going on with the maize and blue. Until next week, I'm Steve Dace and Go Blue.